Hello, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to the leading voices in Bitcoin about their backstories, career paths, and their philosophy on BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. I'm excited to share my guest this week is Alex Gladstein. Alex is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo Freedom Forum, and he is one of the preeminent advocates for Bitcoin as a human rights tool that protects against censorship and government oppression. He's written some amazing articles for Bitcoin Magazine that I will link in the description. And without further ado, here's Alex. All right, Alex, well, thank you so much for joining me on Coin Stories. Super excited to learn more about you. So I want to start at the very beginning. Um, Are you from Connecticut? I grew up in Connecticut, yes. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing and your childhood. Um, I grew up in Fairfield County, Connecticut, uh, right outside of New York City. Um, I enjoyed it. It was very nice. I was very lucky. Uh, Beautiful summers, very cold winters. We had snow days. Um, Ended up going to school in Boston. Uh, Spent a year in London. Uh, Lived in New York City for a couple of years. Uh, ended up moving to California, uh, in about, about 10 years ago. So I've been out here ever since, um, still have family in, in Connecticut and, and New York and, uh, very much enjoy going out there in the summer. Uh, it's beautiful, uh, like living where I live now, but, uh, you know, we'll always have a sweaty summer, summer, summer days and evenings. We'll always have a place in, uh, in my heart, uh, out there. And I, I always love the seasons and usually try to make it out there for Thanksgiving and yeah, for yeah sure. just enjoy, enjoy the East coast. Well, I want to hear more about your, um, childhood because sometimes I think that we're shaped by our experiences when we're young in terms of how we look at money or what we want to be when we grow up, grow up. So when you were younger, did you think about money? Did you know that you wanted to do something with regards to human rights? No, that, that didn't really happen until, uh, right before I went to college, um, I basically got intrigued, uh, by, well, by the Iraq war. I mean, I was shaped by that. So, uh, in 2003, I was a junior in high school and, um, was part, was on the debate team and, um, we had to go up on stage and, uh, and debate in front of the whole school uh, whether or not to invade this country. Uh, and and I, I took both sides, you know, cause I was basically, we did it in partners. So like me and my partner debated this other team and we, we, we debated both sides switched. And then we got, you know, people got to like grade us or whatever. And I just remember being kind of surreal to be arguing to invade this country that none of us had ever been to. Um, and I remained really interested in why did we go to war? And when I, I went to university at Tufts up in Boston, and I, um, I, I took an interest in, in international relations, Middle Eastern studies, human rights. Uh, so I think you could say it kind of came from there. Can you tell me a little bit more about those studies and how they shaped you? Because I heard you on a couple of other podcasts talking about it, and you were like in a class where everyone could recite the Quran, right? And and you were learning a lot yeah. about sort of the different cultures. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I had the opportunity to take a couple of classes about uh, the invasion of, of Iraq from a, a pretty well-known scholar on um, neoliberalism. Uh, his name is Tony Smith, and and he looked very closely at uh, who was pushing us to go to war. Obviously, that was like right in the thick of it. That class was in 2005, so you know about 18 months after we invaded. Uh, but he was very careful to point out that it was very bipartisan. Uh, you know, at the time, the the media wanted us to go to war. 70 plus percent of the American population thought it was a good idea. The administration had gone out of its way to basically convince the people that it was a national security risk. Um, it was really crazy. I mean, I, I, things are crazy today, but I don't think anything is as crazy as what happened then. I mean, just the amount of gaslighting was unbelievable. Um, the mobilization, the fact that basically no other country would, would join our coalition and we ended up doing it unilaterally. I mean, wild stuff. Uh, so that was interesting. And then, yeah, in 2006, I, I lived in London and, and, and got to take a class um, 
uh, on uh, Islam and democracy, uh, where I was studying at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And um, yeah, I mean, half, half the class, at least, uh, you know, were um, kind of diligent and, and um, very, very educated Muslim scholars. Uh, so, you know, we looked at Western philosophy, we looked at Islamic philosophy, we looked at different case studies of different countries. That was very interesting to me and, um, ultimately shaped, uh, some of my views on, on individual freedom. Um, and then that summer I got my first internship at the human rights foundation and, and, uh, ended up working there for, for ever since. So, uh, that, that's, it's been, a, 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 it's been, a, it's been an interesting time. That's for sure. Yeah. So I want to hear more about your time at the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, I I heard that when you started as an intern, you were like dubbing tapes into Spanish or something to send to Cuba. I mean, how did how did your kind of career within that organization evolve? Yeah. So I had a chance to to actually work at British Parliament uh, when I was in London, and uh, I worked in uh, for uh, a shadow foreign secretary. And I did research for him. So I think that helped give me the bump to get the job at HRF. And uh, it was a startup. I mean, the founder is a Venezuelan uh, activist, and he had just created it in 2005. And it really started operations in 2006. So I was joining like right at the beginning. I mean, we're talking a handful of people. Um, and one of the big programs was getting information into Cuba. So my job at, what included, uh, you know, burning movies and stuff onto DVDs and kind of disguising them and, and giving them to people who would take them into Cuba to the underground library movement um, and, and oh, helping wow. design like questionnaires and uh, uh, kind of materials to go with the movies and films, books, music, stuff like that. Wow. Uh, I thought it was really interesting and, and fascinating and um, decided to try to work there. And they offered me a job at the end of the summer. And uh, I started full-time work in, in 2008. Uh, at HRF. So was it during college really and having studied, you know, the Iraq war and starting to work within the human rights industry that you sort of realize that you don't really trust government and that maybe some of this <laughs> d development and sort of decentralization yeah. is the way to go? Yeah, I would say like my uh, perspective has changed over time, but um, in general, working at HRF has given me a tremendous respect for open society and for countries that have some semblance of individual freedoms and, and elections. Uh, this is very important. And, and we obviously, I think we take it for granted far too often, uh, even today. Um, I mean, in a dictatorship, you just have no way to push back or seek reform. It's just a completely different situation. Um, and yeah, through the first 10 years at HRF, I just became, you know, a student of authoritarianism and learned how these regimes use a climate of fear to control people. Um, what I've kind of added to my perspective since then is, is, is the way that I think, you know, big powers uh, are responsible in many ways for these regimes, how, whether it was the U S or the Soviet union or China or the U S today, like kind of pushing and, you know, and, and, and helping these dictators stay in power and organizing a system in which in which these dictators kind of um, uh, benefit. Uh, the, these are these 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 kind of more subtle things are becoming more clear to me now. Um, and I think that I've also become less. Uh, not I I wouldn't say I was ever like uh, hawkish, let's say, but I, I definitely was was of the idea that maybe American power could be used for like good and, and that maybe we should go and get rid of certain dictators and things like that with military force. Um, I, I, over time that, that I've changed my mind on that. And I, I think that that's a, a bad idea um, and just causes disaster, disastrous situations to unfold. And I, I just don't think we should be occupying foreign lands. It just, it just doesn't seem to work out very well. Um, but uh, again, I, I, I in that decade, I learned a lot about how regimes operate, how surveillance works, how uh, coercion works, how do they stay in power, um, what tactics do they use, 
how do activists fight back? Like what tactics do activists use? What's, what's, what's effective to use against the dictator and what's not, uh, uh, the main lesson there is violence is not effective. Like it, when you're fighting against someone who has a monopoly of violence, you don't want to use violence. You're going to lose. So, um, you, you want to use peaceful, uh, you know, methods to fight back. Uh, and that, 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 that's really personified into these, you know, people power movements that ended up toppling all kinds of bad regimes over the last, you know, several decades, which are pretty breathtaking. Um, but there's other people power movements too, right. Uh, that, that are also peaceful and that can, that can disrupt power in a big way that maybe are a little more quiet, uh, which I think we can probably get into. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just developed that deep understanding, I think of, of, uh, open versus a closed society, um, mainly not through books necessarily, but through just working with survivors and, and victims of these regimes and people who've, who successfully overthrew them and, 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 you know, just we're firsthand experience working with dozens and dozens and dozens of diff dissidents from different regimes, whether it be Equatorial Guinea or North Korea or Cuba. And you just start to see how, how similar their struggle is and, and how different it is from people who want to change policy in Germany or the United States. Like, you know, you could equally believe that like Western governments are, are um, aiding and abetting crime and violence, but like the way to change them is very different. Like we, we have many more options on the table. Uh, whereas like not, not so much in, in some of these regimes. Um, yeah. And then about five years ago, I started really looking at the money piece, um, which, which, which has been very interesting. Yeah, so I want to get into that. But first, I'm just curious, because you listed off all of those countries. For people that are just kind of curious about what human rights work actually looks like, kind of day to day or on the ground, are you traveling to these different countries? And how are you actually helping the people there? Yeah, I mean, I've done a fair amount of traveling to Southeast Asia, to Sub-Saharan Africa, to Central America. Um, uh, uh, I, I've I've done some, some, some on the ground stuff, but in general, like my experience comes from, uh, gathering these dissidents together at, at conferences that my organization produces. So we'll bring them to a safe place and they can tell their story. And I get to spend three, four or five days with them every year learning from them. Um, so that's really where, where I've spent and learned the most is through the Oslo freedom forum conference series just getting to spend a week every year, you know, with 50 of the world's top dissidents, you know, and just hearing what they have to say and hearing what they, they need help with. So, so that's, that's where I did the most of my learning was, was firsthand through these people. Well, I know you have met so many people over the years, but can you share maybe one story, one narrative that stands out to you the most that especially people who are interested in Bitcoin might, you know, find to be relevant or really compelling? I mean, they're all relevant to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a tool of freedom against uh, arbitrary power, right? Um, but I mean, there's so many amazing people I met. Uh, Yeonmi Park, the North Korean defector who just was on Joe Rogan. Uh, I met Yeonmi um, in the summer of 2014, and we've been very close ever since. And uh, I have helped her uh, speak all around the world and develop uh, into the incredible force that she is. It's been amazing to watch her the whole way. Uh, and I think she's one of the most important weapons against the Kim regime because she's so eloquent about speaking about her experiences and about what it's like to live in North Korea. Uh, another uh, person we met through the conference was Manal Al-Sharif, who uh, we first met in 2012. And she had uh, the, in the previous year uh, filmed herself driving in Saudi Arabia and and was arrested for it and lost her career and right. she ended up coming and giving an incredible speech at our event in Norway that year that changed her life and she ended up writing a best selling book and giving a TED talk and I, I think like I'm proud to be part of that because there there's a lot of activists that have come through our network and then who have like risen to stardom afterwards or in some cases received a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Lema Bowie, for example, a, a woman who organized a sex strike in Liberia. So where the women <laughs> would basically say no to the men um, until they stopped fighting. I mean, this is essentially what happened. And uh, yeah, she came and told her story in Norway. And look, there's a little bit of influence there because it's where the Nobel's given out. So hopefully that made a difference. And, you know, a couple of years after she ended up winning the prize. So 
we've seen a lot of activists rise to stardom from, you know, from very few people knew them. I mean, Manal had never given a speech in English before the Oslo Freedom Forum. And I mean, Yoni Park was extremely, you know, was not known before, before then. So it's been really uh, 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 just an honor to be able to work with these people as they grow and change the world around them. That's so amazing. And I'm sure that you're learning a lot about the different economic systems around the world. I think one of the things that is great about Bitcoin is it sort of inspires people to really learn about the history of money, how our monetary policy works. So is that something that as you did this work, you realized um, there are some things maybe that America might even have in common with some of these countries as we as we go forward with some of our money printing? I mean, what did you learn about economics or when were you maybe exposed to Austrian economics? Yeah, um, I have to say I so just on those two questions, I I really didn't understand the monetary piece uh, until about five years ago. Um, I mean, of course, like you hear on the fringes about money and problems with money in just 10 years of working with folks like this, but it, you never really, it never really came into focus for me until really the um, spring of 2017, when I really started going down uh, the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And we had our first uh, that in May of 2017, we had our first kind of Bitcoin human rights program and we've just tried to build it ever since. But um, you know, it was um, something that took me, the years literally to, 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 to come into focus for myself. Um, but eventually I just saw how staggeringly, um, important money and was to the human rights story, uh, money as a tool of freedom, money as a tool of control. Uh, that to me is super clear now. And it's kind of amazing that I didn't think about it earlier. And, and I, and I, I commiserate with, most people in the human rights movement who don't think about it uh, because it's kind of hidden. It's kind of under the surface. Had it not been for Bitcoin, I would never have known any of these things. Like it was like the ultimate teacher there. Um, uh, with Austrian economics, I'll have to say, I, I just didn't interact with it at all for like several years, uh, even in Bitcoin. Like, I don't think that you need to have any particular economic philosophy to appreciate Bitcoin. I, I, I think that it, it's quite observable on its own and you can draw whatever conclusions you want from it. Um, so I don't think you need to read anything about Austrian economics to appreciate Bitcoin and all of its forms. There are of course uh, parts of Austrian economic theory that, that map to Bitcoin. And, and I think it's probably a, a, a very worthwhile, um, you know, Got human action over here. Uh, uh, you know, that, like it's important to read these things and yeah. and and think about this age-old uh, struggle between central planning and freedom. And, and I think that at the end of the day, that's that's what it's all about. Because every other fee, every other currency is centrally planned, except for Bitcoin. When it comes to fiat or digital currencies, you know, moving beyond gold, literally, you know, uh, or silver when we're talking about fiat currencies or other digital currencies, they're all centrally planned. There's somebody who makes the decisions about the monetary schedule. Yeah. Not in Bitcoin. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's almost like this manifestation of different economic theories and, and freedom theories. Uh, it is like the, to me, it's like the instantiation of human rights. Like it really delivers where a lot of other stuff is just, um, wishful thinking like it really really is the, the 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 operationalism or the integration of human rights at a deep deep level so that's what i learned about that um and uh yeah just to me now it's so clear to me and so i think pretty easy to explain from my perspective um it's hard to deny like how broken money is around the world right but but that, it's just not something people usually um think about it's not it's not the first thing they think about and was there a lot in common with the countries just in terms of like socialist regimes or the government really in control of you know everyone's resources and the money i mean did they all have something in common yeah i mean look you can think about fiat currencies as like a mark as a free market in a way um kind of uh in as much as they're valued in different ways and this 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 is manifested in bond prices and all kinds of different things. But essentially, you'd rather have the dollar or the euro or the yen 
than let's say the the Argentine or the Turkish or the Lebanese currency. Like there, 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 there's clearly like value difference there, right? And what you kind of see is that generally speaking, powerful, advanced, wealthy democracies um, have done the least bad job managing currencies. And, and a lot of that comes from their privilege uh, and the fact that there's like this network effect that was politically created in the 70s where basically everybody around the world saved in dollar dollars and dollar debt, like in treasuries. Yeah. So my, my America was able to finance warfare and welfare through, through other people, not through taxes or, or, you know, our own, you know, creation, but, but, but through actually borrowing from, from abroad, that, that avenue was not open to a lot of other places. So that, that's very important to understand, but in general, like the fiat currency landscape is, 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 you know, there's a couple very valuable, there's like six or seven reserve currencies. And then the rest are just like, in this long tail of, of worthlessness, right. All the way down to the Venezuelan Bolivar. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Dictatorships have a direct relation. There's a direct correlation between like, you know, corrupt dictatorships and how good, how good is their money? <laughs> like, like if you just named 20 dictatorships, I could guarantee you probably wouldn't want the money from almost any of them. Yeah. I mean, even the Yuan, the Chinese government, which is like obviously the most well-resourced and, uh, and modernized dictatorship, arguably, um, the market doesn't want the Yuan. I mean, it's like 3% of foreign exchange reserves. I mean, no one wants to save in the Yuan. They don't trust it. Uh, even even though China is so rich and powerful, so authoritarian regimes generally don't manage money very well, uh, and and not to say that any regime manages it well, but like they manage it a lot worse than than the EU or the United States. And again, the EU and the United States have privileges that that others don't. But uh, yes, like everybody who lived in a dictatorship has money stories, hyperinflation, financial isolation, etc. And I've tried to bring that to light through my uh, article series at, at Bitcoin Magazine uh, that I've started this year. So how did you actually discover Bitcoin? What caused you to go down that rabbit hole and gain so much conviction? Arguably quickly, I know you mentioned for five for five years, you've kind of been studying money more, but like that's that's pretty it's pretty quick. No, I mean, look, it was on my radar uh, as of 2013. Uh, we started actually accepting Bitcoin. Like my first meeting about Bitcoin and human rights was in 2013. And we started accepting it at my organization at HRF in 2014. So, you know, I just personally didn't, didn't click for me until 2017. I mean, I even met, um, I had dinner with like Bitstein in 2016, I think. And he was just trying to be like, dude, focus on this. And I'm like, I just didn't get it. I just didn't really, it didn't click for me. Um, I think finally went, there was a confluence of things like we, we were finally putting together, you know, we had, we had a tech lab at the human rights foundations. I was the freedom forum event for, for a few years at, by that point. And we always did digital security and VPNs and stuff like that. And we were bringing Bitcoin into the fold. Okay. And I was like, all right, maybe I should look at this. Also the price was going, you know, it was like going from a thousand to $2,000, which was pretty exciting at the time uh, after like a, you know, ridiculously long bear market. Um, and I started to watch some Andreas Antonopoulos videos that really did it for me. Uh, I think he's just at the time, the greatest educator uh, at, at that time was just huge for me to be able to hear him and listen to him was, was really important. Um, and then it just started to build from there. Uh, and I just started to gain more knowledge, more confidence. And yeah, by like the summer of 2018, I felt like I, I had a unique perspective, but it took, it took a long time to, to build that. I think the human empowerment narrative is so, so important when it comes to Bitcoin, um, especially when we bring in things like, you know, politics and how divided the United States is. Everyone can agree on human empowerment and wanting that and wanting everyone to have a better life. So can you talk a little bit about how you think that Bitcoin offers that around the world to, you know, developing societies, but also democracies across the world? Yeah, I mean... I like to think of Bitcoin kind of like digital cash and digital gold. It, it sort of serves both purposes. And on the gold side, you know, it gives people permissionless open access to the best performing financial asset in the world. Um, they don't need a pass, particular passport or status or wealth level. They can access it right away. I can send it to them from here. All they need is a phone. It, most countries have a preponderance of internet 
connection by this point. And even like the poorest countries in the world have 20, 30, 40% of the connect of the population online. Um, and that's just going to continue to, to move towards a hundred percent as we go into the next decade. Um, you know, internet connection will be ubiquitous and that means Bitcoin access will be ubiquitous. And I think that's just so powerful because in, in like a developed advanced country, we have so many options. I mean, we have like retirement accounts, we have 401ks, we have, uh, for, for wealth, if we have enough capital, we can buy real estate, uh, we can invest in, uh, art, um, we can, um, you know, buy different stocks, like, like the, none of these things are available. Even our own money is a relatively good store of value. Like, like relatively, like not, not, <laughs> not compared to like real estate or stocks, but like the dollar only loses a small percentage of value per year versus things like uh, the Ethiopian burr or, or, or the Cuban peso. Right. So um, we're just very privileged. Like we have a very well connected, robust financial system with a lot of options for people to save and, with a lot of options for people to make a lot of money, like, like to really increase their purchasing power. And for the billions out there in the world, you know, for the 87% who don't live in a country that has a reserve currency and property rights secured by a democratic rule of law, for those 7 billion people or so, they don't have any of these things that we enjoy. Uh, in the same way that they, you know, they often don't have free and fair elections and, and independent media and, and independent court system, they also don't have a good investment strategy. There's no, no way for really for them to invest in the future. I mean, they're, they're investing in sheet metal or cattle, uh, you know, things like that. If they can, if they're lucky, some dollar bills, um, gold, if, if they, they can get it. Um, so Bitcoin just completely changes the game. It gives anybody on earth access to the best performing financial asset of the last decade plus, um, and uh, allows them to accumulate it at, at whatever rate they want. And I, I think that's really game changing. On the cash side, it, it's all about freedom and privacy. I mean, it's about having this parallel economy where normally if I were trying to like make a donation to a human rights activist in Russia, there's all kinds of rules. And like, if I tried to make a bank wire, my bank would freeze it or their bank would freeze it. And it's, I can't, I can't, I literally cannot. Like, like if you were trying to pay a Russian dissident, they'd have to literally fly to the US and you have to give them the cash. I've done this before, by the way. Um, wow. so that's how it used to be. I mean, I work with dissidents. They've, they've got to like, I, one of my, somebody who's a dear friend of mine, she put a large amount of cash. She sewed it into her clothing and took it back to a country that, that she was from wow. to get the money in. Um, that is incredibly dangerous and also just really scary. And you don't have to do that anymore. We have Bitcoin. Like, like th th this idea of like moving cash around is something that people still deal with every day and it's dangerous and it's risky and it's, um, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin fixes this, right? So we now have this way of sending value instantly to anybody, you know, without going through the whole like, you know, state apparatus. And, you know, like generally speaking, like the government doesn't know. Like in America, we have this robust surveillance state Right. And we have Coinbase and Square giving all your information to the government. And, you know, you're going to be filing your taxes because they know how much Bitcoin you have. Right. Generally speaking. OK, not the case in Cuba. Like there's just not there's just or Nigeria. Like they're not no one's doing any chain chain analysis there. Like they have they're bigger fish to fry. They, they don't know. They're not they're not know what's going on on the blockchain. So um, Bitcoin in practical terms for most people on Earth is is, is quite private not necessarily because it's privacy technology, but just because the government isn't looking at it. They don't know like how to interpret it or like what it is. If you don't know what it is, then you can't effectively monitor it. I mean, the fact that Bitcoin is pseudonymous and that the, uh, essentially the, 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 the wallets and the UTXOs, I mean, that, that they're not tied to your identity is very powerful. I mean, very, very powerful. Like, yes, if you have the right kind of circumstances, you can, you can de-anonymize people, but you need those circumstances. And that may be the case in an advanced democracy where like everything's been regulated, but definitely not the case in, in most of the world um, where governments are just totally freaking clueless about what's going on in Bitcoin. Uh, and, and you know what? That'll probably change, but at, so is privacy technology like in Bitcoin. Like, so I think you're going to see this arms race happen and I'm pretty optimistic about it. I mean, already lightning is like really robust and 
I mean, you're going to have wallets in the next year where you can like coin join in that'll just be default coin join into lightning. And then you spend on whatever, and no one's really going to have any hope of tracing who that was. I mean, you're just not going to make it, you know, if you're trying to spy on your citizens, if we have this robust mobile privacy, Bitcoin technology. Um, so I think that's huge for citizens also. Um, but, but in general, it's, it's about the two functions of like just the savings technology that allows them to escape debasement and inflation paired with the ability to move it instantly. Uh, you know, especially now with lightning anywhere in the world, um, the, that's the main use case is this just like, it's this money that can be just this bridge to the outside world. Um, so that's, that's what I've observed. You know, I want to ask you, Alex, because I heard you say on an interview that you are extremely skeptical, that you've even like taken tests and you always score super high in, in terms of your skepticism. And I think a lot of people out there are really skeptical about Bitcoin. So from someone who is very skeptical, what got you over that hump when you were down the rabbit hole saying, I really believe in this technology? Yeah, well, again, I had my first, like someone, I, when I checked my email, I looked for Bitcoin and I go all the way back, like people were writing me about it in 2013 and it took me four years to, to really start to grasp it. I mean, that's shows you how skeptical I am. Um, so let's see. What were your doubts before? Were you worried that the government could shut it down? Were well, okay. So first of all, we're in a very different world today, right? I think it's far easier to argue for Bitcoin today than it was in 2013 and 14. Like, when people came to me in 2013 and they were like, oh, we're going to use Bitcoin to do this. My ignorant brain, you know, that had just read the mainstream media, like was basically like, oh, isn't that what you used to like buy drugs on the internet? Like th that's pretty much all I thought, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I remember seeing this piece by Mark Andreessen in the New York Times in 2014. And I started to think there could be something there. But like, in general, Bitcoin just had this terrible reputation, like a really bad reputation due to the mainstream media. Um, and, and they're reporting on it. Like, so, you know, and people tended to focus on the fact that it had dropped from a thousand dollars or $1,200 down to 200 without focusing on the fact that it went from zero to 200. Right. So there was like a dichotomy there that you continue to see today. Right. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I just didn't really take it seriously. I mean, Bitcoin was so risky then. I mean, I, you know, people who say, oh, you're lucky you invested in, no, no one's lucky. Like, you know, anyone who invested in 2013 probably sold it like well before 2017, like, like it's certainly before today. Um, so, you know, you had to have conviction in this thing, like whether it was philosophical or technological, you know, economic, it doesn't really matter. You had to have conviction. And I just didn't, I just didn't have that. I, I didn't, I didn't, it just, it was barely on my radar. You know, I didn't really grasp it as a serious thing. And I think the media climate, you know, helped with that. Um, but once I broke through, I mean, you just really start putting the pieces together, you know? So as far as just the foreign aid industry, one of the things that I saw you write about in one of your Bitcoin magazine articles was, I think you re referenced an essay called Alms Deal Dealer, and you sort of talked about how big the industry has ballooned. Um, and a lot of people, I think, you know, we see countries, we want to offer aid. Everyone kind of has that, you know, bleeding heart. They want to help the, the underprivileged children around the world and all that. But I mean, I think that you see how the sausage is really made. Can you talk a little bit about your perspective on the industry as a whole and what you learned and what you kind of meant when you when you wrote in that article about the alms dealer? Yeah, well, the article alms dealers was written about 10 years ago by a guy named Philip Gorvich, who um, who wrote this amazing book called. Um, uh, where is it? We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. It's a sensational book about the Rwandan genocide. I highly recommend it. Um, and I just followed him ever since. And uh, yeah, he wrote this piece that talks about the history of the aid industry and really like how at the end of the day, like there's a lot of um, critical thought that looks at the aid industry and actually says it, 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 it achieves the opposite of what it says. Like it says it wants to help people and bring them out of a bad situation. Well, in many cases, it helps cement their bad situation. In many cases, it helps prop up their corrupt rulers. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it, it creates dependency. So I think a lot of that has to do with the fiat system that it's contained within. 
um, like the SDRs, things like this, borrowing from the IMF, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I tried to just show how in, in, through kind of two main ways, Bitcoin cuts through that. Number one, obviously just peer to peer donations. I mean, obviously this one's straightforward, like rather than donate to some charity that then uses some bank and then some process. And, you know, weeks later, the money gets to the farmer or the activist, like you can just literally send it to them right now. Yeah. And, cut and, out like, the middle with man. any paperwork. Yeah. Cut and out the middle cut, man. You cut out six, seven, 8% fee. You cut out all the stuff. Okay. Boom. This should be very clear to people. Um, the more difficult thing to grok is like geopolitical dependence and, and aid. Like, mm -hmm. like if a country needs money, that's where it turns, that's where it turns to aid. Please give us money. Okay. Um, now the aid comes with strings, right? Like, okay, now you have to like, listen to the person giving you aid and stuff like that. Okay. What if instead of like taking a loan out or receiving aid, you could take advantage of the natural resources in your country and monetize them? Uh, through Bitcoin mining, which is which is what El Salvador is doing and what many countries are going to do. So they have this vast stranded geothermal, solar, hydro, wind, whatever. Um, and they can they can sell bonds off that if they can if they can provably assess the you know amount of energy that that's there. Um, they can they can start they can finance operations that way. It's kind of amazing. And then they don't have to be beholden to like some alphabet soup organization. I, I think that's a really, really powerful. So I think both of those things are key. And then you look at a place like the Congo where like only 9% of the population has access to electricity. Um, you know, you look at the fact that they have this incredible hydro resource in the Congo in the river and um, how it can be harnessed and how normally it doesn't make any economic sense for someone to come and set up a dam because it's like, there are no customers, like who's going to pay for the dam? Nobody. But if you have Bitcoin mining, then the dam immediately generates revenue and it gives you the money beyond the initial investment, you know, beyond the CapEx to, to, to finance the connection of the people's homes in the area to the power plant and to, to electrify them and to have them stop cutting down trees for charcoal to cook their food, like whatever, 80, 90% of people do in the Congo. Like, so you can really do like Bitcoin mining is like this bootstrap for like modernization, like in a lot of rural areas, in my view. I found your writings on that really fascinating because um, I recently read Saifedean's new book, The Fiat Standard, and he talks about this industry as well. He calls it the misery industry and talks about how government debt actually destroys these third world countries that people are trying to help through this aid. And um, it just I saw a lot of um, mirroring kind of philosophies with what you wrote. But um, just out of curiosity, I, I saw that you divided human rights into two categories, negatives and positives. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So in the history of human rights, um, obviously there's a lot of philosophy and debate going back hundreds of years, but it really manifested into the creation of the United Nations mm -hmm. after World War II, where you had two competing views on what were human rights. Uh, the Americans had the idea that civil liberties are basically concepts that were laid out in the Bill of Rights in America uh, um, were, were important. And, and these are called negative rights. Um, and the Soviets wanted uh, entitlements, basically like freedom to work, freedom to have a house, like things like that, coming from the Marxist kind of communist view. And, and, and those were called positive rights, right? And there was a big debate. And they, ultimately, the UN Declaration of Human Rights has both. If you read it, it has literally like the right to a vacation or something like that. Um, two pages after free speech. So um, to me, like, I, I prefer to call positive rights entitlements. Uh, and I prefer to call uh, negative rights, either human rights or freedoms or liberties. Like, I think they're quite different. One is basically what the government shouldn't do to you. Uh, and one is what the government should do for you. Um, so these are really, really different. And then there's, of course, like other rights, like uh, group rights, community rights, animal rights, there's a whole long tail of rights. But core to our conversation is, is negative versus positive. And I think that what you see is that countries that have really robust negative rights have better positive entitlements or, or a better welfare state or less violence and poverty. Like just generally speaking, they're better places to live. Like Norway has really good, generally speaking, free press, free speech, property rights, elections, uh, all those things. And, and, and it, 
also has very robust, like, you know, social welfare system. The countries that have like, that try to just do the social welfare system without giving freedoms are a disaster. Like, like this is any dictatorship, essentially Cuba, uh, Venezuela, Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you, you can have the entitlements if you have freedoms, basically, and it can, it can work. It works in Northern Europe and in some places, uh, Japan, et cetera. I mean, there, there are big flaws with those systems. Uh, let's not kid ourselves, but, but, you know, you could, you could basically have, if you have freedoms, you, you know, you can have some sort of social benefits that, that don't include sending the Jews to Siberia. Like that, that there's, there's a big line there. Um, but I, I think it's critical to recognize that, that the negative rights are, are fundamental for, for, for civilization. Uh, and, um, Bitcoin is like the instantiation of those negative rights. Like it, like it, like it is free speech, property rights, uh, sovereignty, open markets. Uh, that's what Bitcoin is. And, and it's not about any sort of entitlement or like the government should do X for me. Um, so it, it's, you know, it lines up deeply with like, a, a, you know, with negative human rights. And I, I think those are the most important thing for the foundation of a society. So what do you think about the state of our human rights or freedoms in our country right now with COVID, vaccine, mask mandates? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that Americans have been lazy and have traded so many rights and liberties away during the digital transformation. I mean, I think that we have become dependent on systems that harvest our data and that know everything about us. And that the cypherpunks tried to warn us. And, you know, look, they gave us some technologies that we were using to fight back. I mean, encryption and Bitcoin being two of the big ones. And we got to use them um, to fight back. But, I mean, just look at what's been revealed, you know, by Snowden and, and, and all, all, all sorts of other folks. Um, I think that the last few few the last year and a half have, if anything, they've just revealed how much power the government has. I mean, the, the, even in, even in open societies, like the fact that the government can just like literally like print trillions of dollars to, to, to do X, um, is a little crazy. I mean, that's, that's unprecedented historically. Like we don't know what's going to happen next because it's never happened before, um, to that, to that scale. Right. Uh, or these like, um, you know, super, widespread intrusive public health or orders like th this is not really something that we've seen in a while like these are i mean you know arguably yeah, sure like world war ii polio like we, we, we you know we've been through this before but like not in a long time um so i think it, it's like and, and i just traveled from europe and I, I went through london and i mean these are it's like police state right now like to get from the amount of paperwork and forms we had to fill out just to get from Paris to London was completely insane. Australia um, is so bad right now. No, it's just like, so governments have made it harder to move around. I mean, and yes, they have their like public health, you know, thesis, but like, you just wonder how long it's going to last. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, but, but that's like a general, like I, I that that's uh, regardless of what country you live in, these are concerns. Like my organization did a whole conference on this last year called COVID con, where we looked at how authoritarian regimes were going to exploit this like virus to, uh, to advance their own, you know, measures. Right. And in fact, you're seeing that all over now, not just in authoritarian regimes. Right. So it was kind of predictable. Um, everything's an opportunity to grow more power. Right. So I think we just got to like do what we can to keep our head down and, continue working on Bitcoin and encryption and encourage people to be sovereign, you know? Have you seen any of the studies or the reports out there that there is sort of a more um, friendly feeling or positive feeling about socialism, especially with young people in the United States? And does that concern you, especially in a time where we are giving up um, many of our rights and allowing the government to control some of the things that they never have before? Uh, I mean, less than it used, but look, so if Bitcoin didn't exist, yes, I'd be very concerned. Okay. Um, but you got to understand we're already in MMT, like, like the government already uses and views money mm -hmm. according to the MMT theory. Like there, there is no, obviously there's no debt cliff like anymore. Like we're not arguing about that. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, just look at the the Fed's balance sheet. Yep. Same thing in the EU. So we are now in MMT land. Yep. Like whether or not you people want to acknowledge it or not, like that's where we are. And look, we've been in fiat money land since 71. We just had the 50th anniversary of the Nixon shock. So I think we need to be realistic uh, and acknowledge that our money system has been, you know, taken over by, uh, by people who believe the, who believe that this will be a good thing in the end, but, but regardless of whether or not it's going to be good or not, that's the direction it's heading. And, um, Again, without Bitcoin, I'd be very concerned, but Bitcoin gives us this like plan B, this other thing to opt into. And I also think that like there is a lot of common ground between socialist thinkers, uh, especially on foreign policy uh, and, and Bitcoiners. Um, and I'm gonna be exploring this in a series of conversations over the next year, but like oftentimes I think the best critics of our system are socialists, uh, especially foreign policy. I mean, like, like David Graeber who writes debt, which, you know, I think a lot of Bitcoiners really disagree with, obviously, uh, in terms of like, where did money come from? Um, he has an incredible uh, chapter on the Nixon shock and why did Nixon float the dollar and mm -hmm. the, the way the U.S. uses the dollar as a weapon. And it's laser clear and so powerful. Uh, so even if you don't read any of the other part of the book, I think the last kind of two chapters of debt are really good. Um, Interesting. Michael Hudson's another amazing thinker who's like very controversial, but like basically has been um, really poignant about talking about the, the petrodollar system and about how, how the U.S. government, you know, exerts power and how it finances itself around the world. So, you know, the issue is that, you know, I think the socialists have a lot of good points. There are also a lot of socialists on the um, uh, protecting cash, like like cash, obviously, I believe is a really important privacy and freedom tool. So there are also socialists who, who present cash as like a class struggle thing. And I understand that as well. Okay. Um, so they're, they're, they're often like fighting for the, the same things, but um, they don't understand that the solution is Bitcoin. <laughs> so it's kind of like... Um, you know, they, they're, they're almost there. It's like almost there. <laughs> and there are a bunch of socialist Bitcoiners on Twitter, actually. Mm. Um, they have their own. I, I don't I don't really understand how it works. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? Like, listen, in my research with Cuba in Cuba, I mean, I talked to a bunch of Cubans who are hardcore revolutionary communists and they love Bitcoin. Wow. So I, 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 it's it's. And they, they view it as freedom from the dollar. Mm -hmm. They view it as a money system that is sovereign and, and that, that cannot be manipulated by Washington. And that's true. But it's also true that it empowers the individual and prevents confiscation of assets. So it's kind of like a weird thing where ultimately Bitcoin is going to be the biggest tent because in 20 years or whatever, every single person is going to use Bitcoin. So at least in my view. So it doesn't matter what your political ideology is, you're going to use it. It's going to be more like... Um, yeah. administrative like like i don't think about the ideology of the iphone or or the email or or the internet i don't care who made it and i don't really you know dive too deeply into how these things work functionally from an engineering perspective or what are the trade-offs or game theories behind their adoption totally. most people just don't care they just use it like in fact there's no more like email conferences anymore yeah. like like, cause everybody uses it. Like, I think there's a good chance that in 10, 15 years, there won't be really any Bitcoin conferences anymore in the same way. Cause like, why would you have, like, it's just like email. Why would we have a conference about email? It's like, it's like so ubiquitous. So I think we live in a special time in terms of adoption. Um, but ultimately I think everybody's going to use uh, Bitcoin regardless of their ideology. And look, I think it, it helps save us from the excesses of all these different ideologies. Uh, I think a lot of like uh, kind of hyper-capitalist um, uh, you know, um, activities and, and philosophies have resulted in this like really unequal situation where like a small handful of people control everything yeah. and it's not capitalism. This is not capitalism no. is a great essay by Alan Farrington that everybody should read. I mean, basically the, 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 the profit seeking is one thing, but profit seeking when you have a corruption in the government is another, right? So that's what he's getting at is like, there, there's this Cantillon effect in, in, in capitalism as, as people think they think is cap, you know, when people say capitalism, Wall Street, all these things, what what they're really describing is not capitalism, as as, as sort of properly understood. It's like more like this government subsidized exactly. corrupt beast. And 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 Farrington does a great job laying this out. Like you know, bailouts for corporations is not capitalism. So, exactly. but that's what we have today. So I, I'm 
I'm sympathetic with like Bernie types. I, I think stuff is screwed up. Like I, I, and you know what? Like, again, like I've got my Bitcoin, you know, over here, right? So you're, you're opting out, right? So what does the government do with this money that it can print infinite amounts of? Right. Well, I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather have it like personally, I'd rather, sure, they should give it to college students. I don't want them giving it to bankers. So like, I, I, you know, if, if they're going to print infinite amount anyway, I don't see why MMT and Bitcoin can't coexist like nicely, I guess is what I'm saying over the next few decades. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, no, it's interesting what you said, because I know he doesn't agree with us, Peter Schiff, uh, but he talked about how that's crony capitalism. And I completely agree. Um, I, I want to know, though, where do you see Bitcoin going in the next, let's say, five years? And I want to ask that because right now we are in such a frothy time with our stock market, real estate, all time high, S&P, all time high. They keep printing money and it seems like the government is choosing inflation over tapering, which will crash the stock market. And some of this kind of correlates with Bitcoin, right? Like if the stock market goes up, sometimes Bitcoin goes up. If it crashes, Bitcoin crashed hard in March 2020 with the with the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so just out of curiosity, like what what do you see happening in the next fi- next five years? Do you think that finally we're going to have to admit that we have inflation or do you think the government's going to taper and allow the market to crash? Like, what, well, do you, what do you think? Over happened? the last year, you've seen the narrative in the media go from there's not going to be the inflation to mm-hmm. there might be some inflation to wait a second, inflation's good. Yeah. Um, but that's like in a very privileged conversation about the American dollar, again, which which does not inflate nearly as much as other currencies. Uh, we have, I mean, again, there's like 1.3 billion people who live under double and triple digit inflation already. And, and there's going to be a lot more in the next decade, like moving into that category as fiat currencies increasingly collapse. Um. What's going to happen in the next five to 10 years? Usually predictions do not come true, but uh, I think we'll be a billion users in Bit- of Bitcoin by 2025. I think that's my uh, general thesis. Um, and then we, we kind of go from there. Um, I think that uh, it becomes, a, look, it's going to be a rocky ride. I mean, if the last few months have uh, shown anyone anything. And people will continue to gaslight themselves uh, and, and the media will continue to gaslight them in terms of like when Bitcoin goes from 60 to $30,000, they completely blank out of their mind that it was a $3,000 10 months earlier. For sure. They just can't, they can't bring themselves to acknowledge a bigger picture. And this is actually just remarkable because it's been the whole story for Bitcoin's existence is like incredible purchasing power appreciation for users right over time and yet the media still says it's risky so i think over the next decade we see a huge shift in like pension funds um investors everywhere all kinds of different sectors where today they still view bitcoin as risky right they might start being they might start like understanding it and they might be like okay well we want like five percent or ten percent or whatever it's still viewed as very risky And government bonds are viewed as the safest thing. Okay. So I think over the next decade, you're going to see that swap. And I don't know whether it's a gradually then suddenly thing or whatever, but like, I think by 2030, government bonds will be seen as risky and and Bitcoin will be seen as safe. Do you think the dollar will collapse? I mean, I mean, it is collapse. It's in, if you look at a chart of Bitcoin versus the dollar over the last 10 years, it it is collapsing in a massive way against Bitcoin. I think it will continue to do so, but I mean, you have to like, think about how long all these currencies survive. Like the Bolivar is almost dead, but people still use it. And it's, it's had five, 4,000% inflation for like years. Right. So, I mean, you'd be surprised at how long these like zombie coins can last. I mean, look at some of these altcoins. I mean, they're still around five, six years later, people are still trading them and some of them went way up. So like, I don't know. I wouldn't. I would be careful to write off any fiat uh, or or altcoins, like in terms of like, well, they'll be gone by X day. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, there's a long, long tail for these things, but they all go to zero against Bitcoin over time. I, I think that, uh, yeah, Matt Odell is correct with that assessment. Like everything just goes to zero against Bitcoin, uh, like over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years doesn't matter where it's real estate, uh, stocks, uh, NFTs, uh, altcoins, uh, fiat currencies, gold, doesn't matter. All of it will depreciate in value against Bitcoin, 
you know, in a, in a generational point of view. That's interesting. I was actually going to ask you about that because I heard Raul Paul in an interview recently and he was talking about some altcoins and he said that the future kind of looks like there's going to be a basket of currencies and that Bitcoin, Bitcoin for sure will succeed, but there will be other cryptocurrencies that emerge and that will also have functions. And um, I know that he's a big believer in Ethereum as well, you, but you don't, you don't really see that like any use cases for other cryptocurrencies to potentially emerge as well. I mean, they are here, they emerged. I mean, Ethereum has some large percentage of Bitcoin's market cap. I mean, I don't, we're living in the future. Like here, here's what it looks like. It looks like Bitcoin, the dominant mm -hmm. digital currency. And yeah, there's going to be a ton of other ones. I mean, I think that like over time, the case for Bitcoin grows stronger, but there will never be, there will never ever be a time when like humans don't want to create a new currency. Right. I don't really like, I don't know, like people seem to love being able to mint yeah. something and have it have immediate value and then sell it to somebody else. <laughs> um, I just think those things will become less valuable. Got it. It'll be, you know, for visa V Bitcoin over time. So like, it's even hard to say, but like 10, 20 years from now, mm -hmm. I think that if you use like the fold card and you're getting like five, 10,000 sats back to go to the grocery store, I think that those amounts of money are going to be really significant in the future. At to what scale, I have no idea. I just have a feeling that if you're like a fold card user today or something like that, and you're like, you're at, you're getting five, 10,000 Satoshis here or there, mm -hmm. you want to be saving onto those uh, if you can. And, and in 2031, we'll see what happens. But uh, I think it's just so hard to even fathom because, because of what we've historically seen. I mean, we can't predict the future, but we have history mm -hmm. and Bitcoin went from a penny to $50,000. I mean, that's just mind blowing. So what's it going to do in the next decade? Nobody knows for sure. I mean, there's all kinds of estimates over the next 10, 20 years. It starts eating into gold. It starts eating into real estate. It starts eating into negative yield and government debt. Yeah. I mean, you could have a coin that's I mean, conceivably 10, $20 million. But then, like, then you start getting into the debate about, well, what is the dot? What, what yeah. is this dollar? The dollar is going to collect. Like, right. so it's hard to even say. Let's just, just put it this way is that I think, like, in the future, things like houses and even shares and companies will be like, some of that is being used as money because our money's failing. Like, our money doesn't work very well. So we use other things for store of value. I think that's going to be like fixed by Bitcoin. Like that value will go into Bitcoin as our money and our money will, will, will regain its, its footing as a store of value. Um, and then like, that'll kind of suck the value out of some of these other things for people worldwide. Like you just won't need to buy a house to, to have as an investment. Like you buy a house to, to, to use the house. Mm -hmm. It'll still be valuable. A nice house will still be worth more than a small house, but like, I don't think it'll be worth as much relative to our time and effort as it is today. Like the, these, th these assets are inflated uh, because our money system is broken. Lynn Alden is, is very good at pointing this stuff out. Um, so I think Bitcoin will just, will just continue to just, just increase in value over time, slowly, but surely. And all these other coins, I mean, they're going to be there. I mean, you could think about them as tech stocks. You have to know they're centralized. The small group of people control the, the monetary policy and the issue and schedule, and they get to decide the rules. So you're at their mercy. Um, but you got like, here, here's, the, I'll end with this. Um, Bitcoin is the future. All of these other coins are trades mm -hmm. that people are trying to time to make more dollars mm -hmm. or, or if they're smart, Bitcoin, right? So if you, if you have an NFT, I don't think anyone seriously thinks they're going to have it in 10 years, right? It's, it's, you're, you're trying to like, you got the NFT, you want to hold it for a little while or as long as you want. And then you're trying to sell it into dollars. So you, you make money, right? Like all of these altcoins, NFTs, things like that. Th these are like ICOs. These are ways for people to make money, right? Like Bitcoin is, is how we change money, right? It's different. It's, it's very different. So we have different philosophies here. Um, I think Bitcoin will be the reserve currency of the world eventually. And uh, I think it's just going to be very important. And I'm very excited because that means that citizens will be able to participate in the reserve currency and not just governments. So it's, it's going to be a, a really interesting future. 
Yeah, no, it's really interesting what you said. Willie Wu um, said something similar on my podcast talking about altcoins versus Bitcoin, sort of trading versus actually investing and having savings for the long run. But there are a lot of people out there that see Bitcoin as just out of reach because it's so expensive. So, I mean, what's your argument to people out there that aren't in the space yet um, and maybe do see it as volatile and they think it's just it's out of reach? It, one Bitcoin is so hard to, to access. Well, look, right I assume you're American if you're listening. I mean, you can use cash app and you can buy a dollar a day in Bitcoin. I mean, if you live outside of the United States or if you prefer not to, you know, use KYC services, um, you can use peer to peer marketplaces and buy smaller amounts. You can earn lightning, like, like you can do your work and you can earn, if you're a graphic designer or whatever, you can start to earn lightning. Look at Substack. I mean, you're going to be able to start writing and earning money in Bitcoin, no matter who you work for. So we're heading to a world where like, you can earn small amounts. Like I, I think that the 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 DCA is, is the proper philosophy here. Like you want to be putting a small amount aside for the future. Uh, every day, week, month, whatever it is, you, you want to just be like not thinking about it too much. Like okay, putting in ten dollars, ten dollars, ten dollars, ten dollars. I mean, you're you're converting fiat money that's going to collapse uh -huh. into a just badass asset that's going to grow. I mean, it's a really simple trade. Um, and, and you're putting your time and effort into something that's going to treat you kindly. Like, like Bitcoin is going to treat your time and effort with gratitude and with um, respect. And fiat money is not going to do that. And I think that's a really important distinction. Just to wrap up here, Alex, out of curiosity, you know, looking back on your career, I just want you to reflect, you know, what's something you wish you knew before you went into this industry and organization that you're in, empowering people around the world? Well, it wouldn't be, I wish I'd known about Bitcoin because it was before Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> so that doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I just, I wish I would have thought a little more about money and economics and, and finance. I think it's, it's very important to politics and human rights, even just Bitcoin aside, I think flows of money are, are what drive almost everything in the world, uh, whether it be major political decisions, wars, um, in, in, in occupations. Um, like, why is America in X country? Well, the answer probably has to do with some sort of, you know, monetary interest in some way. Um, so I, I, I think it's worth exploring the world through the lens of money. Um, I've gained a lot from exploring it through the lens of Bitcoin, but you, you could explore it through the lens of any money you want. And, and I think it'll, it'll give you a, a, a great, great rewards.